Hello and welcome to yet another edition of CNBC Africa's monthly debates in East Africa. Today, we're focusing on science, technology, engineering, and math. And we're trying to ask ourselves the question, can African challenges be solved by this? Africa has faced various challenges, as you do know, some of them are uh, have made them miss the first three industrial revolutions. Now, some of these bottlenecks that have brought about by developments beyond the continent's control, such as issues like colonialism and all those that have been here in the continent, poor leadership and corruption are just some of that. Well, I'm joined by a very esteemed panel to help me guide us through this conversation. Thierry Zomahon is a president and CEO of Africa Institute for Mathematics and Science. Next, we have Merab Toahirwa, who is a member of Girls in ICT for Rwanda. Philip Cotton is a vice chancellor at the University of Rwanda. Gentlemen and lady, thank you for joining us. I think I'll start with the lady because there's a lot of conversation that is facing us here and probably the youngest in the room. I'm not being patronizing when I say that. Um, we know Africa has needs, and we've been talking about the fourth industrial revolution. And do we have what it takes to just tip over as a continent? Just paint to us a landscape of where we are as a continent. Uh, well, thank you for having me, first of all. And uh, on an Africa continent, uh, when we say fourth industrial revolution, I may say that we are not late to join in with, uh, to the global, uh, to join the global people on the fourth industrial revolution. However, we still have a few bottlenecks that we need to overtake faster mm -hmm. so we can be able to join others if we, we want to move with the fourth industrial revolution. Um, some of those bottlenecks, I may say, is uh, infrastructure. Uh, when it gets to relationship related to technology, uh, some of others, um, education. Education has to be improved, specifically for young people. If we need to move faster, especially to join others in future in the fourth industrial revolution, because some of these things, if we look at who is going to contribute and who is a consumer, we need to be able to have people who can contribute to the fourth industrial revolution and also the consumer to understand what is technology, what is science, what is engineering, what is mathematics. And not just uh, as a contributor, but also um, as, a, as citizens at large. Everyone has to chip in because uh, STEM is not just about science and technology. It's about problem solving. It's about critical thinking. It's about innovation. So it doesn't have to be specifically people who want to do just sciences. Everyone in each field, either you need skills that are related to technology and science. Thierry, let me just bring you in because when you talk about Africa, we keep talking about leapfrogging, but we cannot leapfrog through everything. Some we really have to sit down and build. From where you sit and the institution that you run, give us a, just a similar landscape of where you see as the biggest needs for the continent. Uh, thanks for having me. You know, um, I don't like the term leapfrogging because it seems to suggest that somehow, miraculously, we're going to jump over four, three bridges and get out to the other side. Uh, where we sit at the moment, and to your question, is to say that we have what it takes to not only join, as Mirab said, the, the fourth industrial revolution, but to lead the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, let me explain this. Right. When you take the, 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 the context we're in now, it says, uh, experts suggest that in less than three years from now, employers in Africa will need 40 million young people with tertiary education skills in STEM. Where are you going to find it? They said that last year we needed 2.5 million engineers. In a country big in the top two economies in Africa, Nigeria and South Africa, they are struggling hard to find and recruit engineers. So whether we need STEM uh, is no longer a question. We desperately need STEM if we want to join the fourth industrial revolution and lead it. We have excuses for having missed the first three industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, the number one which uses steam and water to mechanize production, those were prime eras of slave trade. The second industrial revolution, which uses electric power to, for mass product, uh, 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 production, uh, this era coincided with uh, uh, the colonial era. Right. And then the third industrial revolution reveals, uh, uh, revealed a huge gap between Africa and the Western world in terms of uh, digital economy and digital technology. Now we are at a stage where not only we are equipped, we have the potential 
to lead the fourth industrial revolution, but we have plans in place and actors, stakeholders capable of putting in place the infrastructure required to lead that fourth industrial revolution. Number one, we have the young people. Africa will be the powerhouse of youth demographics by 2050. Right. Europe is aging. Most continents are aging. And who are the people who are going to get curious about technology, about STEM, about science, about invention, about discovery? Those people, you'll find them in Africa. Africa is going to be, become the powerhouse right. for employment. Right. Second, what we need to do is to build ecosystem for science and technology right. across the continent. Thierry, we'll get to that point and exactly how we get to reap from this demographic dividend. Uh, but Philip, uh, you are charged with the responsibility of training a lot of young people who will be uh, driving this revolution. What is the biggest need from where you sit? Yeah, th thank you very much. I, I, I think inherent in your question, that th there's a really interesting challenge and you talk about training young people. I think universities have often seen themselves as places where knowledge is transmitted. So, you know, we, we, we pass knowledge to these empty vessels right. who are students. And so when we talk about realizing what university means in the continent and in Rwanda, we, we have a, a, a particular view and a particular narrative, and we need to go through a revolution because we need to train people right, right. for this knowledge-based economy, but more than that, for a knowledge-applicable economy. And that's our biggest challenge, right. that we have high levels of knowledge at progression points in university education, but very little application. Right. And the kind of skills that Mirab was talking about, you know, being able to evaluate, analyze, and synthesize information, to learn in the workplace, is absolutely vital, to push people out of classrooms. Right. And that's one of our biggest challenges. Right. So for us, university needs to realize a revolution. I'll, I'll get to Mara to just uh, address the issue of applicability of, of the skills, but uh, let me just bring back the point that Thierry made, that the fact that we pride ourselves as having the right demographic to just tip us over, and everybody has been saying, yes, we are investing in this, so we, we should be uh, uh, reaping the demographic dividend at some point. My concern is, have we put in place systems to be able to get us there, Thierry? It's been slow to have the infrastructure and the systems in place right. to harness the human capital that we have. But uh, you see progress. Progress is taking place across the continent. Uh, but at a low pace, if we keep doing this at such a low pace, we might not be able to reap uh, the full right. dividend from the youth demographic. We talk about this slow pace when you compare East African countries like Kenya with uh, the East Asian countries and we say, where did, we, where did the bus leave us? Because we talk about Kenya and you compare it with Singapore, with South Korea, mm -hmm. and you say, 20 years ago, we were almost at the same place. Absolutely. But right now, yeah. they're practically in a different world. Yeah. Where did the bus leave us? I see Mary wants to jump in on this, but let's just have Thierry first and then we come to Education. You. Right. Education and education. Right. If you look at a country like China, for Africa to reach the level of China in terms of the university enrollment, it's going to take us five decades. Mm -hmm. Five decades. You've mentioned education. Just hold that thought. Yeah. Philip, you are in charge of education. Do you agree with his thoughts? And how do we tweak this? Because it's easy to say education. But if you look across the plane, if you look at uh, University of Cairo, 100,000 students, there's a lot of uh, collaboration that we're having with African universities, uh, with the global universities. So what exactly about education are we not getting right? I, I think we're not getting right the, the scale of education. I think we have a a system in certain parts of the world where we educate at an industrial level and where people graduate with pieces of paper that don't actually amount to very much. And one of the things we don't do is at scale recognize individual talent. Um, we see a, we, we, we face lecture theaters of three and four hundred people. We see them as one homogenous mass. Right. And, we're and happy we don't with have statistics. systems for pulling out. Yeah, we're happy with statistics because, right. yeah, I, I, I can educate as many people as you want. Just give me a bigger room. Right. But that's not going to identify the young people who've got that unique set of talents and skills that we can fast track, we, we can create flexible pathways to learn, people can 
and come in and get accreditation of prior learning. Right. They, they, they can accumulate their credits much faster. They can pick and choose courses. You know, why shouldn't you do developmental economics as part of an engineering program? Right. Why shouldn't we all do numeracy skills? Do we have that kind of thinking that, in our academia? We, we do. I, I, I would like to say we do in the University of Rwanda. Right. We, we, we've had a program of, of language skills for a long, long time, English literacy skills and competency skills. We're going to introduce numeracy skills to everybody. Right. You know, M mathematical modeling. Um, we want people to be inquisitive. We want people to be excited by, by their journey through university. It's a great opportunity for people to develop into the wonderful human beings they need to be. Merab, just address this whole conversation about our education and whether or not it equips us to the brave new world that we are going in. And tell us a little bit about what Girls in ICT does. Well, Girls in ICT, what it does is uh, we inspire young girls. We are, in, we are a group of different women who work in technology sectors. So what we do, we go to different schools, we encourage girls to join the STEM fields. And we tell them what we do so we can inspire them. I always tell people that when I grew up, I always saw my brother as a doctor wearing a white jacket and I felt that was cool. Mm. And because young people cannot see technology, what is it exactly? Mm. So it doesn't inspire you because it's not, you know, face on. So we need to show them what we do every day. We need to, you know, you can see a change of what you used to do and what you can do right now. So that inspires um, students to become, you know, more interested into mathematics and engineering classes. Mm. I need to add something about what Thierry and uh, Fuel said about the pace of education. For us to be able to lead, as Thierry said, we, we need a movement. It doesn't have to be just, you know, these curriculums that we put in. It has to be a movement of STEM, and it has to start from the, un, you know, the preschools, children learning from the younger stage until you get to university. Because Phil is in the university, he's not going to change somebody who was born, born, you know, doing something different. Right. But if we need to make it a movement, we need to start from the younger children, nursery school, primary schools. And this thing about STEM, it doesn't have to be, you know, a single narrow lens of science. Right. I studied science, I studied mathematics, I studied engineering, but we all looked at these things differently. We need to look at STEM as an interdisciplinary kind of field where everything cross cuts so together. STEM is not linear. It's not linear. <laughs> just hold the thought because Jerry yeah. really wants to get it right. <laughs> I just want to add to what Mirai is saying that that's exactly how we see it at Ames. When, when we see, we, you look at our institutes, we we don't train mathematicians. Some, sometimes people mm. make a mistake. Mm. We train mathematical scientists. We equip people with analytical problem solving skills, with mathematical skills. And let me say this, if we have to lead the fourth industrial revolution, if we have to lead the world, right. there's one thing that we must keep in mind. As we talk, 65% of children entering primary school in Africa will work in job types that do, don't, do not exist yet. Right. That do not yet exist. So obviously we might be so, training people for the wrong jobs. Uh, absolutely. Right. That's why, what do we need to do about the educational systems we have across Africa? Right. Number one, it is not about designing a specific MBA for those people because we don't know mm -hmm. which type mm -hmm. of job they will mm -hmm. be working mm -hmm. in. Right. So what we need is to make them well-rounded problem solvers, mm -hmm. drawing on arts, drawing on design, drawing on mathematical mm -hmm. scientists, drawing on statistical, statistical analysis, mm -hmm. and making mm -hmm. of these young agents of transformation mm -hmm. people and talent capable of mm -hmm. providing solutions across businesses, across industries, across fields, be it in math, be it in health, in finance, in technology, in energy, in infrastructure, right. they must be able to. It is not about degree. I, I, I totally yeah. endorse these uh, movements thing because that's the only way we can not only catch up, right. but lead the entire world. Let's talk about what does the market need? because we're looking at a continent that stagnated at some point. We have never figured out exactly what it needs, so we have a lot of uh, Band-Aid kind of uh, approaches that we take. We put one and it wears off and we put another one. Give us a sense of, from where you sit, Phil, what do you think are the biggest needs for East Africa right now? Yeah, and, and, and we've got a lot of work coming out of the, the National Commission here in Rwanda, which is helping to pave the way and, and you know, tracer studies, triple helix approach, universities working with government and industry. 
and private partners to try and predict the future, to try and get our workforce ready graduates um, lined up for the, uh, the, the jobs that are needed. But certainly, you know, all, all of the areas we've been talking about today, engineering, we need a lot of civil engineers, people who can actually connect communities right. and make a difference to the quality of people's lives, but people who are safe and competent because the jobs that they do um, demand a high degree of professionalism and, and, and ethics um, in the technology sector, in the pharmaceutical sciences sector. And again, you know, it's really good hearing Thierry talk from his perspective because it's in accord with what we believe in the university, that we talk about pharmaceutical industry and pharmaceutical sciences. We're not talking about um, developing pharmacists. We're talking about developing problem solvers. As Merab says, people who can work across disciplines, who have right. multidisciplinary perspectives on all of these issues. Um, you know, and, and for me, the talented young people who come to university graduate as talented young right. people at the moment, in spite of what four years or three years at university does to them. Right. And, and we need to be much better at developing, I think Mirab has experience of interdisciplinary postgraduate degrees. We need to look at inter interdisciplinary undergraduate degrees that offer that pluripotential could, opportunity for so, people. Sorry to just get in, yeah. could the label that we have as degrees mm. be the problem? Because we've seen mm. education institutions across the country, mm. I could give you the example of Kenya and Tanzania, mm. where we're scrapping off uh, technical mm. colleges and we're replacing them with universities. Yeah. So the young men who are going there just want yeah. a paper, they want to dress well, and they're graduates. Yeah. Could that be where we need to start? I, I think you're right, and I think, I, I don't know what Mirab and, and Thierry think, but, but you know, I think we should be much more bold and courageous about blurring the boundaries between vocational training and technical education and the knowledge-obsessed education that people encounter when they come to universities. Right. You know, we've got people working in teams who graduate from, in industry now, who graduate from university working with people who graduate from TVET. The people in TVET have the skills, they have the management and teamwork experience. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a real disconnect right. when we put these people together. So let's be much more bold about that. Let's much, be much more bold about uh, an assessment of competences and attributes and skills right. while developing inquiring minds and uh, knowledgeable people. Uh, so, so let me just, Mayor, we've had the joke that an engineer in Africa would uh, buy a TV and when it breaks, he'll take it to a TVET guy to fix it for him because all through his learning, he never yeah. got to fix it. We have also the similar situation in Kenya mm -hmm. where we have thousands of uh, graduates graduating with a degree in pharmacy, but we do not have a single manufacturing plant in Kenya. Mm -hmm. We all manufacture from India. Uh, how do we bring this all together? Okay, so there's a difference of going through school and you're getting your degree right. and actually getting the skills of doing what you're supposed to do. Uh, in that sense, I mean, we, in schools, most of the time we learn five plus five equals to 10. Right. If you get seven plus three, you get 10. Mm. But we need to teach, hey, this is 10. Please give me an answer of anything you're going to apply or add and mm. you know, solve this problem of 10. Mm. So I need to learn that five plus five can get, five, can get 10, seven plus three can get 10, right. six plus four. You know, I need to come up with those solutions myself as a student, not you teaching me, mm. you know, this is mm. X. If you add this and this, you're going to get this. I need a problem and give the students an opportunity to explore that problem. Right. My answer may be different from your problem, your answer, but we are all coming up with a solution of that problem. Right. I guess that's where our school should be leading to, mm -hmm. which again I say that can only be achieved if we interdiscipline all this mm -hmm. science mm -hmm. and engineering and technology. I wish there was like a curriculum in school, right. like starting from preschool, right. actually teaching STEM, <laughs> yeah. you know, completely. Well, it starts at Montessori and ends there. <laughs> remove the whole science and remove the whole technology and right. just touch teaching students students how to do problem solving. Because right. whatever they will do in future, that's where it's going to start from. Thierry, as you make your comments, uh, please touch on analytics and how then do we include, because we just, uh, about 10 minutes, we'll take a short break, but uh, I'd like you to touch on analytics. And has Africa em embraced data-based decision making? Uh, actually, if we haven't yet, we have to. Right. Because it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a curve that will not be reversed. So distinguishing between education, degree-based education, and skills-based education mm -hmm. is key. Mm -hmm. you, master's degree, PhD, doesn't make you 
employable, right. number one. Analytics, it's so fundamental that if we have to harness the whole potential we have in, in the field of energy, for instance, for agriculture, it's important we have people who can analyze what the situation, the issues are exactly. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not able to formulate your problems, right. you won't be able to find solutions to the problems you're facing. Right. So, and the only way you can have that, some people will say, will think it's only by just doing pure math or pure statistics. No. Mm -hmm. You combine mathematical, art, and design skills. Right. Because you good. need to be able to apply. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. right. Because if you, it's just about math and physics in a lab, you might not be able to apply whatever you are up to. So that's number one. Number two, it doesn't happen by miracle. Mm -hmm. It happens when you give young people mm -hmm. the opportunity mm -hmm. to learn differently. Right. Mm -hmm. Where the teacher, the professor of math and physics, are no longer the priest or the pastors preaching for students to right. say amen. No, you should they, put, they are not a monopoly to absolutely. the knowledge. Absolutely. Mm, right. the, mm. the, the, the learners today should be in, fully in charge of their learning processes. Right. And the teachers should be the facilitators of skills development processes. Let me just throw in a question because we need to take a short break. But Thierry, what do you see as the biggest challenge to this proposal that you make? Is it resource? Is it policy? Is it just how we are wired? What is the biggest hurdle in the achieving this? The biggest challenge is changing our mindset. Right. Mm. You mm. still have traditionalist conservatives there. And these traditionalists might be in position of leadership. Absolutely. Right? The biggest challenge is changing our mindset, number one. The second is resource, because it's not cheap. Let us not forget it. This, we're not talking about charity here. Mm -hmm. If Africa is serious, there's a lot of resources to be invested in this area, and for the next 50 years and, and beyond. The third is policy, but let me say, we're not, we don't have a policy problem on the continent. Actually, we have too many policies. Mm -hmm. The execution of those policies, if we can start executing 20% of the policies right. we have today, right. Africa will be better off. Fantastic. Let's put a pause there, but uh, if you're watching us from across the continent, this is uh, the monthly special CNBC Africa panel conversation in East Africa. And today, we're discussing what is the role of education in the growth of a, a, a continent? Can we reimagine the education systems in East Africa and how can this get us to where we need to go and grow our economies. We'll take a quick break, more of this after the break. Welcome back, you're watching the special CNBC monthly debates in East Africa and today we try to reimagine education and the role it plays in the future of the eastern part of this continent. I've been speaking to Thierry Zomahon, who's a president and chief executive officer of the African Institute for Mathematics, Science and Science. Also, Merab Tuahira, who's a member of uh, the Girls in ICT uh, for Rwanda. Philip Cotton is a vice chancellor of the University of Rwanda. Gentlemen and lady, we identified some of the challenges that we do face in the continent, and we realized that a lot of it is we need to rewire our education process. The difference between those countries that were with us 20 years ago and where they are now is simply education. Let me start off uh, this with Philip. We've noticed that, yes, our instruction model may need to change, to change with the needs of the continent, and we've seen some of those needs. Um, Thierry also attempted to give us a sense of what we should uh, be looking at. Give us your, your proposals in like, how can we tweak our education system to meet the needs that we've just identified? Thanks, yeah, and, and just before the break, I, I was really excited to hear Thierry um, describe this, this need for um, training around analytics. And indeed, you know, the model is that we should be teaching analytics in the context of agriculture. We should be teaching analytics in the context of engineering rather than teaching students to be agriculture specialists and learning a bit of analysis on the way. Um, and, and, you know, curricula are guided by intended learning outcomes. So you must know this, you must be able to describe this, you must be able to, to show that you understand certain methodologies. Um, but what's more important for us, rather than the horizontal intended learning outcomes, year one, year two, year three, and year four, is the vertical interweaving graduate attributes. So what are the attributes of graduates that the continent needs? Problem solvers, 
people who are able to evaluate, synthesize, people who are able to work in, in teams, people who have a global perspective, people who have a moral perspective, um, people who are ICT savvy. And so we look for nodes within our horizontal curricula in which we can teach. But we do have to transform and change the mindsets, again, as, as my colleagues say, um, in and around teaching. Teaching is a very transactional activity. You know, um, you pay me, I'll stand up, I'll teach you, you write it down, you then go away and remember it, regurgitate it, and I'll give you a degree. Um, we're actually doing young people a great disservice, and we're doing the communities that they should be going on to serve a great disservice. So completely thinking and perhaps flipping on its head, what we do already is critical. Right. Merab, what future, what do you see as a future of education? If you, were, you had a chance to sit where Philip sits, how do you design your instruction to students? Well, like I said, uh, Phil is on a very higher level. Right. I, I really want to start from the <laughs> top, you know, my, my young nieces and nephews right. are like mm -hmm. one, you know, four years old mm -hmm. and five years old. Because those are the ones that are going to go to the university. If you start teaching them problem solving today, if they get to feel stage, they will not be having a problem. Because we are starting to think about these things at a very later stage. When probably, I don't want to say like it's too late, but when it's way beyond of what we are supposed to be doing. Right. My, my thinking What does starting it early mean? Because if you talk to governments like the government of Rwanda or the government of Kenya, yeah. they've given primary school children laptops. And somebody would say, well, we've tried. OK, great. I understand it's good to give students laptops. But what are those students using those laptops for? If my teacher does not understand what I need to be doing to get to where I want mm -hmm. to be, I'm mm -hmm. definitely going to be using my you know, laptop for something else. Right. So it's good to have the laptops, that's number one. But let's also have teachers who are able to understand what STEM means. And also, like I said, to put that STEM into our long studying, like the way we study sciences, the way we study technology, let's put it at a, as an interdisciplinary field, as a course, you know, that you learn day to day in school. I remember when we were young, we used to study mathematics. It was mandatory. Whether right. you're doing geography or whatever, you had to do mathematics. Right. So let's replace mathematics with STEM. So it has mathematics with it, it has engineering with it, it has science in it. And also, so it creates the problem solving and critical thinking for all students. Right. At, any, at the age of the, you know, until from the young stage until you get to the university, then that will solve the problem, a very big problem, actually. Uh, Terry, you had brought the point of analytics, and we're still trying to exploit, and the fact that a lot of African, not just governments, but also corporates, haven't quite embraced it because, one, we do not understand it, or we don't have a critical mass of qualified people who can use it for us. And basically, our decision making is based on gut feelings, based on how you woke up, <laughs> based on what the board thinks. Um, what are the real opportunities in terms of incorporating data-based decision-making in the daily lives of running our affairs as a continent? The opportunities are enormous. Right. Uh, if we manage to do that, we're going to reap a lot of benefits in terms of how we increase efficiency mm -hmm. in our productions, right. how we uh, uh, um, fight against corruption. <laughs> if you don't do proper analytics, you might have find it hard to fight corruption mm -hmm. in terms of how we, we actually boost growth right. uh, and in terms of how we position our continent in big data, in uh, machine learning, in artificial intelligence, which are areas in science which are upcoming. But if I may flip back to yes. your question, yes. what do we do now? Right. Because we can't sit back and we say need to start somewhere. we need to start somewhere. Yeah. Number one, uh, to add to what Phil and uh, Mirab has said, change the pedagogy for teaching STEM discipline and stop looking at STEM in a silo way. Mm -hmm. Number two, transform the learning models across the continent. I'm not talking about reform. I'm talking about profound transformation. Number three, it's extremely important. Women are severely underrepresented in the STEM discipline. Right. We can't keep going the same way. We might have 50% of men doing STEM, if we ignore the second half, Africa is going to go nowhere. Number four, 
it's not just enabling women to have access to STEM discipline, right. but it's about retaining them. Right. Because in the finish line, you see fewer women than even the few mm -hmm. who got in in the first place. Let's just address that concept of the gender parity that we do see here. And Mirab, I like your comment because you're leading a team of girls and women who are changing this narrative. Um, but we, we talk about this glass ceiling. We talk about this unwritten code that uh, women cannot go past a certain point whenever it comes to science or engineering or tech. How did we draw that boundary and how do we undo that? Uh, well, um, what I always tell people is we need a society that is behind girls. We need a society that is going to encourage more girls. We need a society that puts in policies and allows girls to not just to go to school, but to continue to get to a certain stage. Mm -hmm. Because as Thierry said, you may find most students in uh, science or computer science, but at the end of the day after college, you're not going to find most of them doing what they actually study. Right. Or you so find going through and getting the qualification is one thing, is one thing. but practice is a different. Practice is very different. Right. It's another different story. You find fewer women there. so. I think is it because of, sorry to jump in, but is it because of the social cycles? Is it because of the social structures? How is it that uh, a woman would go through five or six or four years of a training mm -hmm. and then abandon it? I don't think it's, it's, it's not just social cultural mm -hmm. issues. Right. It's more to do, you know, the environment where you're working from. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that you go on when you have to do problem solving issues. If I have to go home with my laptop every day and you know, it's something different as a mother who have to take care of a, you know, a, a, a kid or something else. Right. So it goes beyond just social and it becomes like an environment. So we need more people to actually push forward this and we need role models. We need to show young girls that you can make it. If I made it, somebody else can make it. Right. If someone else made it, you can also become one. So we need role models to encourage those girls to continue and go beyond just an education. Uh, Tira, as you make your point, also address the issue of who else can play a role in this because the other factor that uh, I think uh, deters women from proceeding is the wage differences. Yeah. There's no equal pay between men and women. So a woman engineer would rather take up something else other than work same hours, same shift with male colleagues who earn probably 70% more. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there are many factors, but let's just tackle three. Number one is family. Mm -hmm. When a woman scientist and engineer found her f a family, mm -hmm. it becomes an obstacle mm -hmm. right. to, the, to the progression of her career. It shouldn't be because it's not the case for men. Right. Number two, financing. You know, in the Silicon Valley area, 70% right. of women entrepreneurs, a women tech entrepreneur who got financing, got financing from uh, uh, ventures, capitalists, or financial, financial institutions, which happens to have at least one woman on their board. Right. So keep that in mind. So it's about governance, it's about policy. Third factor, when a woman is applying for funding as an entrepreneur, the first thing she got, uh, first question she got asked, do you have family? Do you have young kids? Right. Why don't we ask a man that? So if we can start saying in our countries, in, us, in East Africa, on each venture mm. capitalist, mm. on each financial institution, we need women represented on your board. That's, it, it's a simple action. We can start right now, mm. today. Second, if we allow women to have the same opportunities to take care of young families without disrupting her career in exact same way the men are doing it, we can also do that. Now, by creating an environment, as Mirab said, which enable women to put a child in the children in daycare that have been look, looking after right. uh, so, so she can continue doing whatever she's doing. And lastly, uh, it's not. It's also about discrimination. If you forget every everything, mm -hmm. it's a gender discrimination is still there. Right. It's still there. The macho machism is still there. It's still rampant. So these are things we can tackle today, and we don't need a huge investment. We don't need money. We don't need the infrastructure. We just need government decisions, policy makers to sign a piece of paper right. and make sure that those pieces of paper are trans translated into concrete actions. Phil, where do we start as we try to, because we've agreed we need to start somewhere. Mm. 
clearly we're lagging behind. Um, they've mentioned very two key areas. First, we start with early, early education. Um, there's a women question, the gender question. What do you see as a low-hanging fruit? I, I think the gender question is, is possibly a low-hanging fruit. I mean, we could go for a low-hanging fruit such as agriculture and food security, perhaps as a domain or a disciplinary domain. But a, a real low-hanging fruit has to be the gender question because there's nothing to suggest that, 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 that there's a deficit of skills or knowledge or ability within the young girls who could possibly come to university within the continent. So we have to address that problem. And, and I like what my colleagues have said. And, and I think we should remember what Thierry said is, is, is true, and we just don't like it, and that is that there is an inherent prejudice. And that prejudice leaks through in many, many ways. Many of the societies around the world are andronormative, so things are set for men. We right. talk about he and we talk about him. We, we, we're addressing many of the structural issues in Rwanda. And within the University of Rwanda, we have breastfeeding areas. You know, um, people who have childcare um, responsibilities come into work a little bit later so that they can drop their children off at school. We have maternity leave, which, it, which is very supportive of women. But there is still this underlying prejudice. And I think you have to go back to, to, to the area that Mirab is talking about, right down to, to preschool. You know, what's going on there in societies? What are the position of girls there? You know, what are the activities that girls get involved in rather than boys? What are the expectations of those? And then we can jump right up. And, and there's a real low-hanging fruit in terms of role models, as right. Mirab says. You know, what are the glass ceilings, as you say, um, in academia? Why do we have so few female professors in our universities? What's going on there? And we know that women are reluctant to go forward for promotion for all sorts of reasons, because many of the promotion um, committees will be made up of men. Um, many of the promotion committees will have a, a macho way of, of looking at um, what is a robust piece of publication, for example, mm -hmm. and the robust areas in which you work because we dumb down qualitative research and you could suggest that, the, that, you know, that there's a gender divide. I, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case at all. Um, but we look at the profile of, of, of the young people who go into the different professions, the caring profession. Um, the engineering profession, and there are distinct gender differences, and that goes back, right, right the way back. So I think there's a real low-hanging fruit around gender that we can... We can Thierry, do you want to make a point before we shift gears a little bit? No, I just want to say that I uh, yeah, resonate, what uh, Phil and uh, Mirabs has said resonate with me, because in our institute, you know, we're training mathematical scientists. And we said we want in the next decade to achieve the parity, 50% of men, 50% mm. of women. Mm. Right now, we stand at 30% of mathematical scientists trained across the mm. AIMS network being women. Mm. We're not satisfied. This is not to mm. say it's, mm. it's okay. Mm. But where we're getting, this is when, when, uh, why, when uh, Mirab said we should go back to the very bottom. It makes sense because we're getting students who've already had uh, uh, A-level plus four years in mathematical sciences. So where we're getting them from, we don't have uh, uh, a critical mass of population to get 50% of women there. Right. That's why we need to go back to our local communities and raise awareness mm. about the mm. importance of science mm. for women. Mm. Not only mm. women having access, but women staying in the field and prosper professionally mm. in the same mm. field. Mm. Right. Mm. Let's address the issue of who needs to do this because we've not talked about government for a pretty long time during this conversation. And the reality is that uh, a lot of our African policy makers simply don't get it. And this is evident in terms of the disbursements that we see every year whenever East African economies are reading their budgets. How then do we get them to listen and to effect this field? It, it, it's a tough one coming from Rwanda, isn't it? Because um, our politicians do, do listen. Right. Um, we've got some of the most innovative and forward-thinking policies around girls and women and their, their contribution to society. Um, but again, you know, it's about addressing inherent prejudices and, and 
there, there are lots and lots of ways to do that, but I think we just have to keep approaching it from as many different angles as possible. And perhaps Rwanda, um, I mean, it's already a place that people turn to and look at in terms of female representation in Parliament. Um, and, and increasingly, I think, we can become a place that people look to to look at the kind of organizations that Mirab is spearheading right. and other organizations that are not just token efforts, but are real movements for change. Mm -hmm. Mirab, obviously, yes, Rwanda is a shining example of this, but this is not the case across the continent. How do we get our political leadership uh, and, their, and their representatives to listen to us and to put the resources where they need to go? Well, I think uh, for the government to listen, they need to understand what the problem is going to, they're going to be facing in future. Like uh, Thierry said, in future, there are going to be jobs that are not created today, that are not there. So how are we preparing the people to be able to take over those kind of jobs? How are we preparing our consumers in future to be able to get hold of those kind of jobs? So when we say about what can we do for them to listen, we need statistics. We need things that, you know, something that you can measure so that they can actually understand. Mm -hmm. Because in future, it's literally going to be a problem, not just for, mm -hmm. for Rwanda, not just for mm -hmm. Africa, right. but I think even globally. Because when I saw some of the statistics, even in the US, they're suffering of, you know, having law students, law people who are interested into STEM fields. Mm -hmm. So let's make it like a statistical issue knowing that in future it's going to be a problem. Right. We're going to have to all these industries, we're going to find other people from different countries to come you know, in our own countries in Africa to take over our jobs, take over our, you know, our main ways of where we're supposed to be living. It's going to be a crisis. Right. So to solve that crisis, we need to start mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. so that by the 30 years, we are prepared to face that crisis. Sure. I distinguish among the A, B, C league countries. Mm -hmm. The A are countries who have understood. You don't need to sensitize them. Rwanda is one of them. Mauritius is one of them. The B League, they have understood, but they don't have the resources or the execution capacity right. to tackle the problem. The C are those we need to work on. And <laughs> like, like my colleagues have said, you know, two things you've got to show them. If you see how uh, STEM field is contributing to the increase of GDP of a country like the UK, right. but in, an, in the next two years, Mathematical sciences, the STEM field, will have contributed by 140, 140 billion pounds mm -hmm. to the UK economy. If you see that there are valid research, and you can tell our policymakers valid research conducted by distinguished practitioners who suggest that when women are given equal opportunities on the job market, right. it helped jump GDP by 10, 12, or 15 percent. You don't need magics to understand that. Right. But it is up to us, uh, non-governmental actors, to show policymakers, government officials, concrete and tangible results. Right. Look at this. Do you want to lag behind? Look at that. So when you do that, the C group of countries, thank goodness, in today's world right. in Africa, there are very few. Uh, maybe out of the 50, number 52, they're about 12 or 15. Mm -hmm. I don't want to name them. Right. But those who have understood, <laughs> right. the bigger group is the B. Right. They've understood. They will tell you, we have this policy, but how do we implement it mm -hmm. is where we're struggling. Right. Let us, uh, gentlemen and ladies, shift the focus a little as we bring this to a landing and talk a little bit about what are the pitfalls of the fourth industrial revolution? Because we've said we are all rushing in there, but are we ready? And if we are not, there's several studies that have been done suggesting that automation is fantastic, but if it comes at a certain time where an economy is not ready, we might see job losses. Do we have a population that is prepared for this? And I, I see uh, Merab noting, let's start off with what are the dangers? Are we ready for this or are we just bracing for something that will uh, destroy us in the process? Well, the good thing is if you understand the danger, you can start today to prepare for that danger. Right. So. Is the danger there? Probably yes. Right. Are we prepared? I'm not really sh quite sure right now. But uh, do we know the problem? Yes, we do. If we know, and actually it's not a problem. 
there's always change. Mm -hmm. We moved from the Stone Age right. to what we are today. And clearly there's a very big difference of how we are living <laughs> yes. from what they lived before. Did they create, of course, did they, did they, did, did they make people lose jobs? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is life better? If they had jobs then. Of course, if they had jobs. <laughs> is, is life better? Right. Definitely yes. So how are we preparing ourselves to get to that? Losing jobs because of automation is not a problem. Are you helping people to be innovative enough to use what is existing, what right. is going to be there, to create more jobs that they can use? In because the, the concern is bulk of the African uh, workforce is largely unskilled. They do not have specific skills. And when you talk about automation, for example, so you have this bunch of people who used to work at the tea picking factory or they sort it out. You have this fantastic machine that does that at half the time and 100 times the efficiency. Obviously, uh, industries will adopt to that, but where do you take this large group of people who we haven't equipped them with specific skills? Innovation, inventing. Right. It's not gonna stop. There's automation in some way, but there's innovation of so many other things that you can do with, with, IT, with technology. You know, if we lose jobs because, you know, this innovation, this, uh, this fourth industrial revolution has right. come, mm -hmm. there's other jobs that we are creating. There's data science that was never there. Mm -hmm. There's so many other things that we gain by losing what we are losing. So let's focus more of what we can do so that we can prepare the young people that are going to grow up right. to be able to take over such, such issues. Terry, should we, should we be worried about this? Um, I would surprise you, I'm not worried about this. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, having said that, we have to confront the facts and what we have to uh, take on, right. head on, uh, to be able to position ourselves in the fourth industrial revolution. Are we ready? No, we're not ready. Uh, do we have to be ready? We actually have no choice, we have to get ready. Mm -hmm. and, and, and see what is critical here. Mm -hmm. All the discussion we're having for Africa to be ready for the fourth industrial revolution boils down to one word, right. skills. skills. Mm -hmm. What do you make of this massive workforce? And Africa is going to become the powerhouse of workforce. It's by training them, uh, not just let's stop thinking about universities, secondary school, mm -hmm. training them to get the skills they need to be employable right. and to, to undertake ventures to be entrepreneurs. So finally, uh, what is important to keep in mind here, we cannot do this in isolation. Mm -hmm. Not University of Rwanda all, uh, on its own, not girls in STEM, not AIMS. We have to be able to grow right. uh, uh, systematic ecosystems and develop organic ecosphere for STEM and innovation. That's the only way I believe we can help prepare our workforce right. for the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution. Right. Phil, as you give us uh, your, because I want us to give us a, a closing comments as we bring this to an end. Um, are we ready and what do we need to do to get there? I, I think we need to have a, an open debate and discussion about all of these issues. I mean, I, 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 I would suggest that a tea picker is not unskilled, that a tea picker has a particular set of skills and qualities. They, they, they know the leaves to pick. They've worked out ways to be much more efficient and effective and to share the labor um, amongst themselves. And I don't think the people who developed automated machines ever developed those machines without viewing and observing and talking to the people who do those things by hand. And so I think there has to be a better recognition of what we mean by skilled and unskilled. You know, but, but we have to liberate people to learn. And our current systems do not liberate people to learn. They constrain people. In the university, we're introducing man a mandatory course on, on culture, which is about transformational change. You know, students don't know about the fourth industrial revolution. They don't know about the other three. They don't know about industrial revolutions. They need to learn understanding that history. They need to learn understanding that perspective. And at the moment, we don't have the right educational methods for that to happen. Will, sure. the, will the fourth industrial revolution disrupt jobs? Yes, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. going to disrupt mm -hmm. millions of jobs. Right. But at, at the same time, it's going to reimagine mm -hmm. how we mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. It's going to provide mm -hmm. billions of opportunities for young Africans. Because each industrial revolution 
has it disrupted jobs, right. but it has also generated more jobs than the previous one. Mm -hmm. Final word, Merab. Uh, final word. Let's have a STEM movement. <laughs> Let's start it today, and we have a STEM movement so that actually everybody can understand what STEM means. At mm -hmm. a younger age, we have a movement that the way we, you know, I don't know how many movements have been there, but let's have a STEM movement mm -hmm. starting from the young age. Everybody should understand what STEM means and what we can do to get what we want. I let's have, the moment. <laughs> let's yeah. have Phil give his, uh, his closing remarks because we, we had him uh, take the question and didn't get a chance to. I mean, l l let's go with Mirab's suggestion, why not? L l l l let's um, usurp the, the fourth industrial revolution with a STEM revolution. Mm -hmm. um, but let's, let's take the discussion that we've had here even further and deeper and more far-ranging than, than ever before. And we hope everybody will be listening. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We have to leave it there, gentlemen and lady. That has been a fantastic conversation, trying to reimagine the future of East Africa in respect to the education and the sort of knowledge and skills that we do pass. A lot of issues have come to forth. We've realized that they, we still have a gender question when we talk about uh, advancing STEM and whether or not uh, women are well represented in the whole STEM conversation. There's also the issue of resources. Do we have the resources to drive this conversation? And do we have the policy? The policy is there, but we need the resources. There's also the need for a wider conversation between the different approaches, whether academia, government, or enterprise, to get all these three groups to work together for Africa to truly advance. Are we ready for the fourth industrial revolution? As my guests have said, maybe not. Do we need to get ready? Absolutely. That's pretty much where we leave it this afternoon. I've been speaking to Philip Cotton, Vice Chancellor, University of Rwanda, Merab Tuahira, who's uh, uh, leading girls in ICT for Kigali, Rwanda, and Tio Rizoma, who's founder and chief executive of IMS. My name is Bonnie Tunya. Thank you for watching.